Well, thank you very much, Joe. It's a pleasure to be here. I always like uh, coming to Foreign Policy Association events. It's always an interested and interesting audience. So it's a good opportunity to discuss some of the issues that are facing the global economy. And instead of sort of going through the whole routine of what's happening in the global economy, I thought I would pick up a few themes that I think are particularly important and try to build what I have to say around those themes, one of which is that we have increasingly uh, in many countries a, 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 a sense of populism that's beginning to grow um, quite intensely in some countries, including the United States, but it's not limited to the United States. And it's occurring in many other parts of the world as well. And it, the populism really manifests itself in different ways. In some cases, it's sort of general populism, people who favor redistribution of income and things of that nature. In other cases, it's localism, and that is to say various groups, various ethnic groups, various nationalities are beginning to assert themselves within their own countries. And you see examples of this, for instance, in Scotland and Catalonia and some other parts of Europe. But in other parts of the world, people sense an identity, an ethnic identity. Uh, some people call it identity politics. But it's a sense that people do not necessarily see the nation state as the primary political vehicle for expressing their ideas. It's more smaller entities like Catalonia or Scotland, or um, in some cases, it's political parties, political parties of the right or political parties uh, of the left. It's sort of political populism. And you see this today um, in France. You're seeing a lot of, of, of pressure uh, from white right-wing groups and a lot of pressure in other countries from uh, left-wing groups because they're sort of polarizing the political system in these countries. So they're trying to figure out ways of dehomogenizing themselves, of identifying themselves, of asserting their interests, not so much on a national scope, but in terms of specific political parties, specific regional groups, or specific identity groups. And this is a huge challenge uh, for, for many economies and for many political systems. And you have to ask yourself, well, why is this occurring? In part, I think, it's the result of the financial crisis, where a lot of people, particularly people who are in small businesses or are considered on the margin society or consider themselves on the margin society, they feel that they've been hurt by the political, by the financial crisis. And when assistance has been provided, it's not to them. It's to big banks or big companies, and they haven't been able to benefit very much from it. So they see government as, as an alien force, or at least a non-responsive force from their point of view. And they are beginning to think, including in the United States, that, that uh, what goes on in Washington is sort of inside baseball. If you're powerful and you're wealthy enough, or you have good lobbyists, you can get uh, legislation that favors your interests. But if you are not in that group, if you don't qualify, if you don't have influence, then you don't get to have influence on the, uh, uh, on the system. Um, so you don't benefit from what's going on, even when there's prosperity and globalizations bring benefits, when there's new investment, when the economy is beginning to pull out of its tailspin as it is now and it's beginning to grow, many of these people don't believe they're benefiting from that growth. So when you ask Americans, is the economy doing well? For people who live around here, perhaps it's doing very well, but if you're in a small shop in, in Des Moines, Iowa, you can't get capital, you haven't gotten bailed out, you have a, uh, a problem in that you simply are not benefiting very much from pos prosperity in this country. And then you have a lot of people who feel that globalization has adversely affected them. So that while we're negotiating trade agreements, a lot of people feel that the trade agreements we've already negotiated haven't benefited them. If you took NAFTA today, which I think has been a major success and subjected to a vote in the Congress, it probably wouldn't pass. It barely passed before, but today it would probably not pass at all because there are people who think globalization is for wealthy, large, uh, big enterprises, for instance, you know, enterprises in New York or California or Chicago, big cities, big multinational enterprises, but don't really benefit uh, the little guy, the small company, the worker. 
So there's an anti-globalization feeling and then there's sort of an anti-bigness feeling that Washington or big business or big finance just is not responsive to the, the needs and concerns of the average person. And in Europe, you're seeing this in large measure, and I think we'll see it a great deal in the new elections that are coming up for European Parliament. These are in May. European Parliament in the past didn't mean much. Now the European Parliament, since the Lisbon Treaty, has a lot of influence, particularly over trade issues, but on many other issues as well. And you're seeing a lot of these uh, right-wing or left-wing populist groups doing quite well in the polls. So you may well find that the elections for European Parliament represent in the minds of people a feeling that Brussels, where a lot of the decisions in Europe are now made, is non-responsive to them, is distant, is remote, doesn't really care about them, they don't know much about how the European community works and therefore they're alienated and therefore they're supporting groups that are more nationalistic, more populist. They're also, of course, concerned that many of these countries have not come out of the uh, downturn uh, very well and, and there's still a lot of unemployment, particularly in Southern Europe and in Greece where I just was for a few days, in Italy, Spain, Portugal and some other countries. So this has fed this populism, but it's not just in Southern uh, Europe. You have in Greece um, the, uh, a, a party, a sort of a, a strong right-wing uh, party uh, called the New Dawn and you have in uh, France the National Front, which both of which are, are destined to get fairly substantial amounts of support in these elections. Now, how much remains to be seen, but in many of these countries there are these groups, and the bigger political parties are losing support, and some of these parties of the right and left are gaining support. So we're beginning to see this, this notion of, of, uh, of populism of the right and the left. We're also seeing increasing amounts of ethnic politics, of, as I say, identity politics of groups. And we're actually seeing it in part uh, in Ukraine, and not just Ukraine, but other parts of what the Russians call the near abroad, where you have ethnic Russians, and they're now um, beginning to demonstrate their own uh, sets of identities in their region, not to the same degree in other parts of, of Central Europe uh, as in um, Crimea, but nonetheless people are beginning to think in terms of ethnicities. You're seeing this in Syria where you have not a, a group of people who are looking to uh, have a unified Syria, but a lot of people, a lot of groups, uh, the Druze for instance, the Kurds and, and others who, uh, and certainly the Alawites, who want to preserve their own identity and whether there is a, a liberation of Syria or not, they want to preserve their identity and they're part of Syria so that you may end up with a Syria that remains united under one broad set of, of borders and one government, uh, but the real influence is in the various regions that are controlled by the Alawites, controlled by the Druze, controlled by, uh, by other groups, the Kurds and others. So we're beginning to see in, in the world a lot of these groups that are trying to assert themselves within their own countries, which weakens national governments and leads to lots of friction uh, within various countries. So when you look at this, you talk, you see uh, an attempt to have global trade negotiations and a lot of things that operate globally. The financial system is global, business is global, but within countries, there's a lot more uh, assertion of a cultural or na or uh, or uh, identities of various ethnic groups in these countries. And this, I think, is making a big difference. It makes it harder to govern these countries if, in fact, there's less support for the national government and people owe their allegiance to uh, these identity groups, these cultural groups, religious groups, ethnic groups. And this is going to make a big difference. So it means that on one hand you have globalization, and on the other hand you have a lot of regionalization and a lot of fragmentation within countries, which makes it harder to govern those countries, and it leads to internal friction in those countries. And I think this is a trend that we've seen, not just in Europe, where I mentioned uh, Catalonia and, and Scotland, but in many other parts of the world as well. Not so much in Asia, but I'll get to Asia in a moment, but even within Asia, you see in various parts of Asia, groups that are asserting their, their own cultural identities, but the, the trend tends to be more in those countries that have suffered downturns or suffered some sort of frustration with globalization. Much of Asia has actually benefited from it, 
and therefore is a little less sensitive to these types of forces. The second major set of forces is regionalization. And this um, is something that I think is more uh, focused on what's going on in Asia and Russia, but it's not only those two uh, regions. Let me talk about this for Russia. It's fairly obvious, and I'll talk about Ukraine in a moment, but if you look at Russia, what uh, Putin is trying to do today is fairly clear, and that is Putin several years ago made the statement that the biggest tragedy of the 20th century was the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Now, you know, you had World War I and World War II, so I don't think most Americans would subscribe to the notion that the biggest tragedy of this period was the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Most Americans would probably regard that as one of the great successes of the 21st century. But it just shows you how differently we perceive uh, <coughs> historical events. And to Putin, and I think not just to Putin, we, we should be very careful when we describe what's going on in Ukraine and in Russia in just attributing this to Putin and Putin's own, uh, own behavior and his own predilections. There are a lot of Russians who agree with what he is doing, including Gorbachev. Uh, and many of the reformers, many of the people we regard as reformers are very su strongly supportive of what Putin did in Crimea. And while he may be the major actor in the face of Russia today, there's a lot of feeling about these lands. Um, Crimea goes back, was annexed by Catherine the Great. Um, the other parts of the, of the former Soviet Union were annexed by Peter the Great. So this goes back, it's not a communist Soviet Union kind of thing. The czars were the ones who built up Russian influence in many parts of the Caucasus and many parts of what we would consider today Central Europe, including uh, not all of, but certainly a significant part of Ukraine, but, but Crimea was in that category. And there were battles with the Turks back and forth because some of these were parts of the old Ottoman Empire and their battles, uh, their battles with the Swedes. The Swedes, we shouldn't forget, owned a fair amount of this territory f a little bit further north in the, in the uh, Baltic area but they were controlled by the Finns, the Swedes, the Danes, and others. And Russia, over the period of time, not under the communist government, but under the czars, built out its influence um, into uh, Central Europe and into Southern Europe, into the Caucasus, and into Central Asia. So there is a lot of feeling that this is really part of Russia's heritage, that it's not just something that Stalin did. It, it goes way back, and it's sort of deeply ingrained in the Russian culture. So what Putin is really trying to do is restore uh, Russian power. He doesn't necessarily care about the global system, about running the global system. In that, in that sense, it's not quite like the Cold War where you had one system competing against another. With Russia today, it's more about Russia reasserting the strength of its role in its region and what the Russians call near abroad. And in China, while the, the approach is a little different, you see China also pushing out its influence, pushing out its influence into what they call the Eastern Sea, which is close to Japan, and um, south in the area in the, uh, the various parts of the Pacific, um, around the Philippines, around Vietnam, and in, in other areas of that region where the, they have something called the Nine Dash Line, where they're building out their, their influence. They're beginning to build up gradually a blue water navy that can uh, assert Russian influence in the area, I mean, so um, Chinese influence in the area around the South China Sea. And they're beginning to push out further and further. They're quite cognizant of the fact that if they do this too abruptly, they'll frighten their neighbors and they won't enhance their influence. It will cause problems for them. So they're beginning to do it in a gradual way, but nonetheless, they're increasingly assertive of their interests, particularly with respect to various island groups and various territories that are claimed by uh, the Philippines and by Vietnam, but they're also pushing uh, their influence further and further south. They haven't gone to the Straits of Malacca yet. They haven't really <coughs> gone to the Indian Ocean in any large measure, except as part of the anti-piracy uh, flotilla that was organized. And that was quite interesting because you had not only uh, the Chinese who were moving their ships into this because they had a number of their ships pirated in 2009, 2010. <coughs> but they've actually served in the flotilla under a British admiral 
So when you think about, the British sort of ran this thing very informally. So you see that you begin to see the Chinese moving out, t testing the waters, seeing how far they, they can go. And they have something called the string of pearls, which are little, in some cases not so little, um, bases, this is not for military, but for commercial purposes, where their commercial ships can uh, get food and can dock and dry dock and get repaired. So they've done this all the way through the Indian Ocean over to, over to Pakistan. So China's beginning to push out its regional influence, particularly in the South China Sea, but in other parts of the region as well. And they're also trying to extend their influence into places like Kazakhstan, the area around China. Again, it's not so much they want to take over the global system, but they certainly want to exercise far greater influence in their region of the world. And that includes the South China Sea, the Eastern Sea, and further over toward Kazakhstan and Central Asia. And uh, as a result, you have these two great land powers in the region, China extending its influence to its east and Russia extending its influence to its west and the south, not always through, and in the case of China, really not primarily through um, use of force, but just gradually pushing greater extension of, of its maritime presence, greater extension of its economic presence, and certainly greater extension of its of its um, political presence. And the, the problem is for the United States that we uh, have really not been seen as uh, consistently engaged in the region, particularly in, in East Asia, but also in Western Europe. The notion of a pivot to Asia was seen by the Europeans as demonstrating a lack of consistent American support for Europe. The president has not been and he will go this month, but he's not been to Brussels. He's not been to Brussels to meet with EU officials or NATO officials in the time he's been in office. So what kind of signal is this send to the Europeans? And in general, we've, as one European put it, the tapering has not just been by the Fed. The tapering has been in America's interest in, in Europe. Well, now this is a wake-up call, what's happening in Ukraine, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But in Asia, there's been a greater degree of emphasis. We have these Marines in Darwin, Australia. Uh, Secretary Clinton went out there a few times, but the president, don't forget, canceled three trips to Indonesia, which is a place you would think he would really want to spend a lot of time. The United States has played a greater role in Asia, but the fact that he didn't go to the last uh, ASEAN summit has given the Asians pause. Do they, do they really believe that the Americans are going to be there 10, 15, 20 years from now at a time when we're cutting back on our military spending, and when we're again re-engaged with the Russians in Eastern Europe and we're tied up in the Middle East where we were supposed to be pivoting away from, that was the whole notion, we're winding down in Afghanistan, we've wound down totally in Iraq, we're going to pivot to Asia. Now they see us focusing more on Iran, focusing more on Syria, focusing more on Russia. Does the United States have the staying power, the commitment to continue to play an active role. And the Chinese, of course, are saying to these countries, look, you better make your deal with us, as the Americans may or may not be here 10 years from now. We will be here. We're here. We're your biggest trading partner, and we're the biggest military presence in the region. And it's not going to get smaller. It's going to get bigger. So this sort of regionalism is beginning to, to emerge. Now, what can the United States do to address this? I'll just touch on two things and, and then we can talk about them a bit later. One is the TPP negotiations, the trans Partnership negotiations. These are critically important. But I think the understanding in the Congress is very limited about why they're important. The Congress, and in fact, most Americans don't even know they're going on. The Congress knows they're going on, but the Congress is quite concerned because it's of the view that these are negotiations in some cases with countries with much lower living standards in the United States, much lower wages, much lower environmental standards, poor workplace standards in places like Vietnam. The Japanese have traditionally had problems in giving access to American automobiles in Japan, so Detroit and Senator Levin and others are concerned about this. As a result, the, the, the negotiations have not proceeded as rapidly as hoped for, but it's an opportunity for the United States to really demonstrate a strong future presence in the Asian region, in the Pacific region. Um, Australia's in them, uh, New Zealand's in them, Brunei, Singapore, uh, Vietnam, and Japan. So there are opportunities for the United States to play a stronger and more 
institutionalized economic role in the Pacific, but we got to get the negotiations done. And after the president mentioned that he wanted what's called fast track authority or uh, TPA, um, Trade Promotion Authority, to, to, uh, to facilitate these negotiations, the very next day the majority leader, Senator Reid, said he wouldn't support them. Now, partly this is because they're not popular and he wants to get through the November midterm elections, but the signal to our trading partners, a Democratic president says that he wants this authority and the very next day the majority leader, who's also a Democrat, says he flatly opposes this. Well, what kind of signal of consistency does this send to these countries? We have to sort of ask ourselves that, but we're really not doing a very good job of, of understanding what kind of signals we're sending to the rest of the world. So this is, I think, one thing. And then, um, that, so that would enhance our ability to combat the kind of regionalism which is moving out as a result of growing Chinese influence. This TPP was not designed to oppose China. It was designed to strengthen America's role in the Pacific in the fastest growing economic er uh, area of the world. But it also has the effect of demonstrating to these countries that this, that the Pacific is not a Chinese lake, that the United States does have economic interests there. And these economic interests uh, coexist with growing uh, uh, political and security interests. So they're really part of a whole. And in this area, you really can't separate economic power from uh, broader aspects of foreign policy. They're really part of the same whole. And if we can't complete these negotiations successfully, it's a terrible signal to the other Asians about America's staying power in other aspects of uh, visibility like the military and, and like uh, foreign policy. So this is one way we can address this. The second way is um, the negotiations with the Europeans, which leads me to, uh, with, to the Ukraine issue. Um, we have now a series of problems in Ukraine, which all of you, I'm sure, follow quite closely, and it's quite interesting and also very difficult to understand exactly where Putin is going. But we know one thing, he's, he's now, as a result of instability in Ukraine, as a result of Russia's own interest in expanding uh, its influence in an area that, after all, was only given to the Ukraine by uh, Khrushchev. It was part of Russia for centuries. Um, now he's taking it back, um, as, and not just taking it back, but there's sort of a popular feeling in, in Crimea that it should go back to Russia, uh, not among the Tartars and certain Ukrainians, but certainly a large number of people. I don't know if, the, if this uh, poll was 90%, uh, 97% support for it, but certainly a lot of people support in, in, in Crimea support this. But basically, what's happened here is three things. One, you've got growing political support in part of Ukraine for closer relations with Russia. Two, you have uh, Putin concluding that the West is not yet prepared to do very much, may do more. And three, you get very strong pressure in Russia to do this, and not just to stop it uh, at Crimea, but maybe go further. It's very hard to know what Putin's doing because there are a lot of troops on the border on the Russian side of the Ukraine border facing off uh, against uh, Ukrainian troops on the other side of the border. So what can the United States do? Just very briefly, and then we can go to questions. One goes to the question of TTIP, the trade negotiations. The President's going to Brussels next week. It's a perfect opportunity to demonstrate leadership uh, by agreeing with the heads of the EU that this is a high political priority and what could be a more powerful signal to our own people and to Moscow in solidarity with the Europeans than to boost support for and elevate to a presidential level and head of state level the effort to conclude an agreement on the transatlantic trade and investment partnership. This can be a very powerful signal to the rest of the world and to our own people that this is strategically important as well as an economic benefit for the United States. So far, it's been dealt with at a technical level, and there's a lot of wrangling among the negotiators who are quite good, but they really haven't achieved a lot of progress. Maybe the heads of state and government can push them to make more progress and give it a greater degree of, of, in, of impact in terms of, of progress and in terms of, of people being aware of the importance of it than it's had in the past. So that's one thing we can do. Second is energy. The, this notion that somehow 
we have all this energy leverage over Russia is really misplaced and I think misleading to most Americans who hear it. Uh, and this Boehner said, well, we should just give them more gas and oil. Well, first of all, the government of the United States does not own the gas or the oil. Second, there are laws passed by the Congress, I might add, that prohibit the export of, of oil from the United States, from lower 48 states. And there are procedures that limit the degree to which you can export uh, LNG, liquefied natural gas. There's only one plant, that, new plant that's been approved. That's in Louisiana, a company called Chenier. There are five. You have to get prom permission from the Department of Energy and FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, to, if you're going to export natural gas, one company only has gotten that approval, and that plant will only be ready at the end of next year. So there are five more have gotten approval by the Department of Energy, but not by FERC, and there are 21 somewhere in the line, but they can't all be built all at once. Uh, it takes sometimes five, six, seven years, and they cost something in the order of $10 billion per plant. So getting the money, getting the people who can do it, and take skilled workers a lot of times. So the notion we can just somehow snap our fingers and provide gas to the Europeans or oil just is not correct. And misleading, actually. And the Russians know this. They're, they've studied this very carefully. They're aware all this rhetoric is just so much rhetoric. Uh, the, the Europeans themselves are hurting their own cause because the Germans have decided they don't want any nuclear plants to be built and are closing the ones they've got after Fukushima. And um, the French have given up um, on fracking. They do not permit fracking. And there are other countries that are reluctant to engage in fracking for environmental reasons. So they themselves are limited in what they can do. And there are these pipelines that are beginning to be built, in some cases have already been built, across Turkey, across this one trans-Aegean pipeline that's, under, uh, that's being planned that can get gas and oil from Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan and other places to Europe uh, without going through Ukraine, without going through Russia, but most of the gas and oil that goes to Western Europe goes either from Russia to Western Europe or through Russia, from uh, Central Asia through Russia to Western Europe. So Russia has a lot of influence. Now, the, if the Europeans decided we don't want Russian gas and oil, we're going to embargo Russian oil and gas, that would have an enormous impact on Russia, but it would also have an enormous impact on Europe. Now, fortunately, we're moving into the spring. The Europeans have money, have uh, gas and oil, particularly oil, stored up. So they could do this if they wanted, but it's, you know, their economies are none too strong, and for them to cut this off, it would have a big effect on manufacturing and on the, the everyday lives of a lot of people who would have to have gas lines and things of that, of that sort. And I don't think that is very popular. They could resort to it, but it would take a big decision, and they certainly haven't come close to making that decision yet. So one of the things I think would be very useful is to have an energy summit where the U.S. and Europe, the U.S. and Canada and, and Europe get together and try to figure out a strategic energy plan to deal with this overall uh, question of, of, uh, of solidarity or, or cooperation in the energy area across the Atlantic and between the U.S. and Europe working to figure out ways of getting gas and oil from the Caucasus and from Central Asia to Europe without going uh, through Russia. And the last economic thing they can do is provide support for Ukraine. Ukraine really is desperate. Now, here's the problem with Ukraine. It's corrupt. And it's, you know, there, there'll be a new government. Um, there is a new government. But there's still a lot of oligarchs. They're very corrupt. The whole system is based on corruption. And is the United States going to provide uh, large amounts of money or the IMF to, so it goes to the hands of corrupt people? They owe the Russians, Gazprom, $2 billion. Are, they gonna, are we going to provide money that enables the, Rus the uh, Ukrainians to pay off Gazprom for the gas that's already been delivered? I don't think that would go down very well in Capitol Hill. On the other hand, if they don't pay Gazprom, Gazprom uses this in, as an argument for cutting off Ukrainian uh, gas because they haven't gotten paid. And the other thing is that they owe a lot, the, the Ukrainians owe a lot of money other than that, not just money to Gazprom, but they owe a lot of money to a lot of people. So is the money that comes from the U.S. and Europe 
going to be used to pay off those old debts, which were incurred by a corrupt government. And then the other thing is that if uh, the IMF does give money, and the U.S. has said it won't give money, any more money, unless there's an IMF deal, the IMF is going to say to these countries, you can't subsidize gas and oil. There are huge subsidies for gas and oil, which enables them to buy all this Russian oil and gas. So uh, if the government's running for office, and there's elections in May, the government's running for office, the last thing they're going to do is say, we're going to run for office, and our platform is, we're going to cut your gas and oil subsidies. Well, that's not exactly the way uh, a government gets uh, elected in, uh, in any country. And we saw this in Egypt. So we'll, it'll certainly be the case in, um, in Ukraine. So we have to figure out a way of providing money, supporting this new government, but doing it in a way that does not enable the government to simply pay off the debts incurred by a corrupt old government or uh, continue energy subsidies or pay off gas problem. This is a very tricky thing. And people say, just give them more money. Well, even the Russians, who were going to give them $15 billion before, not anymore, but before, even they understood how corrupt the place was, and they didn't want to have their $15 billion be sort of frittered away. So they were, they were committing it, but they weren't providing it. And the Europeans have said, well, we'll give them $11 billion. But again, they are insisting that a large portion of that be attached to an IMF program. Could, could a Ukrainian government that's running for office subscribe to an IMF program while it's running, um, or even when it's in, how do they get support for this kind of very tough program, which is very difficult to do? Um, was, it, the Egyptians wouldn't do it, and I can't see a Ukrainian government which is in a, in a very unenviable position um, doing it either. So these are the kinds of issues that are going to be faced. But getting, getting back to, to the U.S., I think we can do some things. We can move more quickly to strengthen our ties with Europe through this trade negotiation. Won't help overnight, but it helps over a period of time to shore up growth on both sides of the Atlantic. We can provide some support for Ukraine, but not expect too much of the Ukrainians, and we can develop at very high levels through an energy summit or something like that, uh, commitment to helping the whole region reduce dependence on imported Russian oil and gas, not just from Russia, uh, but they get 30 percent of it from Russia. They also get gas and oil from Algeria, which is not the most stable place in the world, and from Libya, which is one of the most unstable places in the world. So the Europeans are in a very, a very tough position. There's still sanctions on Iran. If Iran sanctions are, um, they've, been, they've been mitigated somewhat, but if Iran sanctions are uh, further mitigated, then they'll be able to get some Iranian oil, but that's going to take time to get pumped out. But in the, in the meantime, they're still going to be very heavy, heavily dependent on Russian oil. And there are no, and gas, they're getting more gas from Qatar because we're importing less gas from Qatar, so some of it goes to Europe, but they're still very heavily dependent on imported gas. So, there are very few really good choices for us to impose leverage on Russia, and the Russians know this, and therefore anything we do with all this sort of tough rhetoric, they've made this calculation that there's very little we can do at the moment to hurt them unless we want to hurt ourselves, and they're probably banking on the fact that the United States, we don't have much trade with them, so it doesn't matter to the U.S. very much, but the Europeans do. The European economies are weak, and the Russians have sort of concluded the Europeans are probably not going to do anything drastic to hurt them, they the Ru them the Russians, that doesn't hurt Europe even more. So this is, this is the circumstance we're in. So this is sort of a quick overview of a few thoughts I had on sort of localization, identity politics, regionalism focused on China and Russia, and then how the Ukraine situation fits into both. So now, any questions? No. Bob, thank you very much for hey. that overview. Um, I was wondering whether we could have the benefit of your appraisal of the situation in the East China Sea. Uh, it, it seems to me that there's a good chance that the U.S. could be dragged into a conflict there because mm -hmm. of a defense treaty with uh, Japan. And uh, I guess the question I have for you also is, did the administration try to lean on the Japanese when they uh, uh, changed the status of those mm -hmm. islets uh, yeah. and, and maybe uh, conveyed the message that, you know, that, that they could be on their own as opposed to this 
current situation where we might have the equivalent of, of uh, uh, moral uh, hazard, as it were. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the U.S., I, mean, I was in the meetings because Secretary Clinton was still in, and we had a lot of conversations with the Japanese. The history of the, of the change of status of these islands is very interesting. Um, they, the, the fact that the government changed the status was precipitated by the fact that the mayor of Tokyo actually wanted Tokyo to buy the islands. Sounds crazy because they're not near Tokyo, they're way to the south. Um, and he was a very nationalistic figure, and the government... He, he has spoken in our forum. Oh, has he? Yeah. I'm sure yeah. he's, he's had a guy. few things. He's an interesting guy. Not the most constructive of no. individuals. So, um, uh, but so the government thought it was doing a good thing by not letting this ultra-nationalist who was mayor of Tokyo buy them. They were owned by individuals, one individual primarily. Very, the whole thing was is bizarre. Um, and the government said, we, we want to, we'll take them over and um, reduce the chances of friction because the mayor of Tokyo might have used them for, would have used them for demonstrably nationalistic purposes. So the government uh, took them over and the government thought it was doing something constructive, but the Chinese looked at it as changing their status. And under various agreements, the government of Japan had committed not to change their status, the status being they're owned by individuals, privately owned. So um, the U.S. tried to encourage the Japanese to work this out. This is the old government. This is not, not even the Abe government, so not as nationalistic as the Abe government, but the, the government d decided it was the right thing to do and thought that it could work with the Chinese. Well, it turned out that it, there's now a sort of a stalemate with a lot of jockeying, with Chinese ships going around there and Japanese ships going around and, and sort of um, stand, a standoff in certain parts where they're sort of circling one another. And it is a dangerous thing. It is a tinderbox. And there's always the risk of a miscalculation somewhere. And when you have heavily armed ships going very close to one another to sort of box the other out, you have growing Chinese influence in the region. But the Japanese are not going to stand down. Certainly under this government, they're not going to stand down. And there is that, there is that risk. So the United States did caution both of them to try to avoid uh, confrontation and reach some kind of agreement on the status of these islands, but they have not. But it, it's a big test of nationalism because there's nationalistic feeling on the Chinese side that these islands are Chinese by history. And the Japanese have argued, well, no, now they're Japanese, that we, we had possession of them. Uh, whether Who has sovereignty over them is still a debatable point. But the, but the United States is, is supporting Japan. And, is, um, and we have certain agreements with the Japanese that, uh, that require us to support them. But, but also, they're, they're a major ally. And the other countries of the region are, are seeing how far we'll go to support them, because they're trying to calculate how far the United States would go to support them if there were a confrontation with China. So it's not just a test vis-a-vis -vis Japan, it's a test vis-a-vis -vis the whole um, area of the South China Sea. And what do our allies see us doing? Do they see us being firm or do they see us being uh, sort of um, feckless? And, and then um, on the other hand, if you're too tough and too assertive, then you provoke a confrontation with the Chinese, which no one wants us to do either. So treading very lightly, but being assertive enough to be credible is a, is a very, challenging, uh, very challenging thing. What was interesting, and it was a sort of an odd signal to the Japanese, w this was done right before Biden made his trip to China, as you will recall. The people said, why would the, Jap why would the Chinese do this right before a Biden trip? And the answer is they did it because there was a Biden trip, because they wanted to be able to say, look, we have taken a tough position. We're putting these naval ships right near these islands. And they're little rocks, really. Um, and then the Americans still, they couldn't be that outraged because they send their vice president here just after we've done this. So they're going around the region saying, the Americans really are not that serious about supporting their Japanese friends because they sent Vice President Biden over here a week after we took this action. So they, they did it in part to demonstrate to these other countries 
look, the Americans are not as assertive and as supportive as you think. And it, they, it was seen in the region as a bit of a sign of, I wouldn't say weakness, but lack of full resolve, I would say. Thank you. Yes? So um, it seems that uh, after the 2008 uh, financial crisis, there was a lot of um, focus was on uh, debt and demographics, uh, sort of a slowdown in the developed countries and a concern that uh, you know, we seen that growth to debt. And it seems that uh, the central banks have been really trying to prime up the, prime the economy since then, and it seems that China has also become sort of a global engine of growth. But now there's concerns that China has gotten that growth through debt that may not be sustainable. So, so what does it take to keep this growth going, um, and if it, uh, you, know, you could, maybe if you could focus more on the China part than on the central bank part, because the central bank part, I don't think anyone has an answer to, but maybe in terms of China being able to continue to grow, you know, are, are they at a point now where they're having, they seem to be having some difficulties growing, what's it take? I think they are, I think the, I think your assessment's right, they're having some difficulty, they're not as focused, they, they've said about seven and a half percent growth. That's what they announced that they would, we would say give or take, but they said about seven and a half percent, which means they're probably willing to tolerate a little bit less than seven and a half percent. But below seven is troublesome to them, not because that number is so important, but because that number suggests a low rate of job creation, which is really what they're worried about. So they, they've got a whole series of challenges. One is, as you correctly point out, the debt situation. There are all these, what they call shadow banks or trusts, they call them trusts, that are, or, or private banks, this is not the big state banks, but private banks, that lend a lot of money to uh, state and local governments. State and local governments can't tax in China, so they get money in two ways, they borrow it, or they alienate land of peasants and sell it to developers. Well, of course, that alienates farmers and, and small shopkeepers whose land has been taken from them by the local government of the local party, that's not particularly um, conducive to their being, uh, achieving sort of a popular support in their regions. And you need popular support in your region because if you're going to get to a higher level of authority in China, you have to demonstrate that you can succeed in your city or your province. So they, while they don't have democracy, acceptability in the eyes of the people is very important for people who want to advance, as is growth in wherever you, you're mayor or governor of or party secretary. So in, if, if you look at the people who are on the, the uh, Politburo now, there are seven people. Six of them have been either um, provincial governors or uh, party chairmen in one or more province. So they got there by doing well in various provinces. Well, if people don't like you because you've stolen their land, um, that doesn't help you to be a member of the, of, the, uh, of the public bureau and if you don't achieve growth. So how do you achieve growth? You can't alienate land indefinitely and just tell people to go, go away. So you borrow and, and these um, trusts have lent over two trillion dollars. It's a lot of money. You know, China has three and a half trillion in reserves, but they surely are not going to use two trillion to bail out all these um, all these trusts or these shadow banks. So they're trying to get them to cut back. They're trying to get them to take a more uh, restrained view to do credit checks. They don't, in some, in some, some cases, the party secretary calls the bank and says, my friend wants to build a factory. It's going to hire 500 people. Lend them the money. So it works. Well, now the central bank, the People's Bank of China, and, um, and the government itself is telling them don't don't do this, but there's so much pressure at the regional level to continue to do it that they're finding it very hard to uh, contain this growth in credit. If they, if they do contain the growth in credit, and they're making some progress, then it's going to slow growth. So they have to balance off their concern about too much uh, tightening as a result of credit tightening um, against the notion that if they don't do this, they will, uh, the, the debt will continue to pile up and they will incur these contingent liabilities. So it's a, it's a big problem. At the same time, they also have to deal with the corruption issue. They have to deal with the, um, the environmental issue, horrible pollution in China. And if, in a place where you only have one child per family, 
If that child gets sick because the air is lousy or the water is lousy, that causes demonstrations too among people who don't like these you know, terrible polluting factories that, that are all over China. Not just Beijing where you see it in the newspaper, but every medium-sized city has a similar problem. Not everyone, but large numbers of them do. So this is a, also a big challenge. And the other is rebalancing. So they're trying to depend less on exports and less on investment and more on consumption, but that process uh, takes time. Once th and now they have a social security system and they have, um, which farmers can benefit from, which was not true in the past, and then they have um, an agricultural, then they have a system where they will uh, provide you with a certain amount of medical support in uh, rural China, which was not the case before. So they're trying to give people more confidence about their security of their health care and security of their, of their social security so they won't save as much, so they'll spend more, which will boost their, their consumption, which they want to do. On the other hand, that in turn requires the government putting more money of its own up, and they're very cautious about doing that too. So they've got a lot of balancing that's going on. Is there any sort of a breakthrough though, where I mean like if 50% if of your GDP is fixed assets and investment spending, so you're just borrowing money to build things, you can't do that forever. No, so they're, well, the, they're aware of this. And, and absolutely, and the reason, the reason commodity prices have gone down is because that slowed down a lot. So demand for copper, iron, coal, all these things that was such a big thing in terms of global demand is now receded quite dramatically. As a result, prices of these things have plummeted, and largely because Chinese demand has declined because the investment, this infrastructure investments declined. So they're, they are tightening up, but they don't want to do it, they don't want to overdo it. And of late, they've cut uh, interest rates because they were concerned that the tightening had gone too far. So they're, they're, they're engaged in a very, very complicated balancing act. That, that seems to be the issue, right? That they need to increase the domestic consumer demand? That's the, that's, that's the goal, but it's very difficult to do that. Um, it's picking up, but it's certainly not what they want it to be. But they can't continue the borrowing binge because that creates all these liabilities. Uh, we have a question over here from our board member. Uh, Some places. No, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi. Just right. wonder if you could talk a little bit more about tactics in the West's response to what's happening in, uh, in Ukraine. It's, you know, what, what I gather from what you were saying earlier, that there's really no expectation that uh, Putin's going to leave Crimea. Mm -hmm. So, you know, thinking about the sanctions, the visa restrictions, and so on, you know, what, 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 what realistically is the game here? And, uh, how do you feel about the potential escalation issues that that might have in terms of, you know, particularly business? Um, many American companies have uh, capital deployed in Russia. How do, how do you think that all plays out? I think it's very hard to, f to determine how it plays out at this point. I, certainly the things we've done so far, including the announcements made today, have a very minor impact on Russia. Um, and on the oligarchs, they really, I, I have to say, do they care? Maybe they care. The question is, does it really have an, a bite? The answer yeah, I don't want to have my visa restricted when I need to go to Russia as well. What business is there and so on. Well, they haven't done that yet. Um, but they will, because they, they need your investment um, at some point. But, they, but it's not inconceivable they will. They've done a few things. They've named members of Congress and said they can't go there. But, you know, restricting business people at this point maybe not the kind of thing they want to do. I mean, it will probably hurt the co-op or the condominium market, the co-op market in <laughs> New York or Las Vegas or Aspen, but probably not, um, not a major impact. But it could get, almost certainly there's going to be escalation, and almost certainly American businesses will at some point uh, be adversely affected. Here's the problem, though. The Russians, um, they themselves are a little bit cautious about overdoing it because they want, um, they want to get American investment. At this point, though, the big problem for them is that in the current environment, a, very few companies are going to go over there on investment missions. You're not going to see the Department of Commerce leading investment missions to Russia anytime soon or trade missions anytime soon. And their economy is in dire need of diversification. They, half of their government 
revenues come from oil and gas, half. So they have been talking about diversification for a long time, but it's not happening. But what do we expect the effect to be? Of the sanctions? Yeah. I think the effect of the sanctions is going to be minuscule. I think that the effect of the chill in the investment environment and the trading environment probably, th these are non-sanction related, but they're sort of derivative issues. I think that will have an adverse effect on the Russian economy because the, the rubles decline, the Russian stock markets decline, although when the sanctions were announced, the Russian stock market went up. So it gives you some sense of how they regard the sanctions as basically, if, if we have to, we, what we decide to do in terms of sanctions, we have to be prepared to live with for a very long time because none of them so far are going to have any effect on budging. They're not going to leave the Crimea. They're not going to leave the Crimea. Mm -hmm. Certainly not given the kind of pressures that they are under now or are likely to be under. Um, I just don't see it. This is, a, this is a very popular thing and I don't think any Russian, even on the left, even on the reform side, is going to get up and say, well, we're under sanctions. Let's, let's leave. They, they, this is a country, if you read any Russian literature, deprivation, pain, suffering, read Dostoevsky. These people live with this. This is not uh, something that's uh, alien to them. Look how many people they lost in World War II. They, they, Russian nationalism, and then they have the support of the church. Shouldn't forget that. The church regards all this as protecting uh, Russian Orthodox who were subject to discrimination or violence or what have you. So they have the support of the big supreme moral authority in Russia, which is the, the, the Russian Orthodox Church. So they're not going to, you know, short of a huge collapse in their economy. And they have 500 billion in reserves. We shouldn't forget this. So they're, they're, we, we better be prepared, whatever we do, to live with for a long time and be frustrated because uh, it, 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 they, they sort of brush it off. And there will be some consequences for American companies. The ability to, to get contracts for American uh, air car, uh, airplane, for Boeing, for instance, for Caterpillar, some of these big ticket uh, infrastructure plays, they're going to go to somewhere else. But the question is, you know, who, to buy big airplanes, there are two suppliers, Airbus and, and Boeing. So if you want to buy airplanes, there are not many choices. For, and, and the big industrialized countries that support these um, sanctions will suffer, but there are not many alternatives for the Russians to buy the kind of things they need to build out their infrastructure. So they'll just postpone a lot of these big projects for a while. They're prepared to live with a lot of, of, of difficult, difficulty in managing their economy for a period of time while this all plays out. And it's not going to play out any time soon, I think. And barring some miracle, I don't think that that's going to happen. And Putin knew this. You know, he'd been planning this. This is not something I'm he just said. What I think with the West, I think the problem with the, I, I think the problem with the West is what is a gain? Uh, if the sanctions don't work, it doesn't gain anything. Um, and the other thing is all the countries that are, have Russian speaking populations. There are 50 million Russians living in the near abroad. You know, Crimea is only a small part of it. There, there are a lot in eastern Ukraine, but they're living in Moldova, they're living in Estonia, they're living in Latvia, Lithuania. I'm not worried about their going after a NATO country. I think that they're not, but, they're, but, in, but in other parts of, of the region, and they don't have to go after them militarily. They could go after them, weakening them economically. They could undermine the influence of the government. Russian intelligence people or in that region from the Soviet period. There were a lot of these people, don't forget, they were all in the same uh, intelligence services. So they, they're, they're all in contact with one another. The, their ability to make mischief and weaken these countries is something we shouldn't, we shouldn't um, underestimate. Uh, we are past seven o'clock, and I know you're trying to catch a plane to Washington. Uh, I want to thank you very much. I want to thank PwC for hosting us, and there's going to be a reception next door. And those of you who have questions, maybe you can uh, uh, corner Bob for a few minutes because he uh, tries to catch his yeah. plane. Yeah, and I want to thank you and uh, PwC for your hospitality and hosting this. 
Uh, it's right in the neighborhood, so it's very pleasant. <laughs> and, I, and I want to thank you very much. It's really nice. Thank you.